Any questions for the second lesson? That was just something for your own edification there. The first one has a few questions in it, which is something that we might get to. But uh, we're going to continue in our doctrine of the teachings on divine imputations, and in particular, uh, imputations of blessings in eternity. Obviously, when we get past the teachings and blessings of in eternity, we'll have to stop and go on to another subject because we will have expired what uh, I have at this time to bring out, not that there's not more in the, in the Scripture. Matter of fact, there's a fellow by the name of Charles Stanley. Some of you have heard of him. He wrote a book called Eternal Security a long time ago. It's not a big book. As you can see, though, he is a much younger man than he is now. Uh, but it's still, uh, there was a lot that was brought out that I thought was pretty good. That was in 1990. So that, it's been a while. But he has a chapter in the book called Gold, Silver, and Precious Stones. And I think it's interesting for us to understand that this knowledge that has been shared for the last, well, let's see, 42 weeks is not uncommon. But it's not taught a lot much today, and it is helpful to us. Now, I will admit there are things that some preachers preach, and I'm not knowing his, stu- his full study on things, but, um, and none of us are perfect, none of us have it all, but there are some things that preachers write that they don't preach on. Or they teach it in their their Sunday school studies, but not out into the media that picks up the service that has all the other goodies with it, like the singing and everything else. So it doesn't mean, like Billy Graham, I've listened to Billy Graham, you've listened to Billy Graham, I can listen to Billy Graham on Sirius Radio, has his own station. That's old Billy Graham, Evangelistic Crusade, him, uh, uh, preaching that goes back all the way into the uh, late, I guess it's late 40s and the 50s. And um, that is a lot there. But I've read a lot of his books. He really knew the scriptures, but his calling was to the unsaved, the lost. So that's typically all you heard was gospel type preaching. But if you studied the theology that he taught along the way, uh, you will find out uh, that there's been a lot of misinformation about the man. And so uh, I think he was a great man of God myself, more so as I study his works. And as I write, I'm just I've just finished getting axes being printed now, Just and I work on something, I fear, I realize how hard it is to do something like that. It is difficult. It is time-consuming. And so I appreciate uh, Brother Stanley's work here as well. Not Ralph Stanley, the Charles Stanley. Ralph's different story. He's Mr. Music Man. But he goes to the 1 Corinthians 3 passage and he notes that if any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer a loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as through fire or by fire, as we know. And he brings out that that is one of the most underrated passages that deals with eternal security. You don't think of that. But the person who has not been a faithful serving believer still remains in the family of God, still remains in heaven, but with loss of reward, not loss of salvation. So I thought that was astute for him to bring that out. He says this statement is one of the strongest supporting eternal security to be found in the Bible. The first man who steps up to be evaluated for rewards represents those who have made real contributions to God's kingdom with the gold, the silver, and the precious stones. They are of such quality that they survive the intense examination of the Savior. Consequently, this man is rewarded for his faithfulness. The second man, or second type of believer, steps up, represents believers who do not have time for the things of God, who live their lives for themselves yet saved. One by one, their deeds are evaluated, and one by one, they burn. His works are described as hay, wood, and straw or stubble. His works have no real substance. They have no eternal value. This man will suffer loss of reward, but not loss of salvation. He will have little to nothing to show for his life. He will have lost everything, but the man still will be saved. 
Then he goes to the next section. He says, good news, bad news. Good news, despite his secure position as a child of God, this individual probably did not leave the scene of life rejoicing. And we talked about dying grace is afforded to all believers, but in it comes in spades or it comes in heavy doses for the positive believer. Not so for the negative believer. If I have lived to myself as a negative believer, and I die to myself as a negative believer, I'm going to heaven, but I'm not going to go with much peace. Because I still have a conscience that is fully, finally awake, that I have messed up and I am not going to change, and I'm going to answer for it. And now comes my day of reckoning. A lot of people don't want to think of Christianity as having a day of reckoning. It's not about sin. That's in the past. But it, it is, we have to still give an account of our lives. It's not like when we go to before the beam of the seat of Christ, we're still not going to have to give an account of our life. And that should be, you know, you know, a red flag when we're not living right. Anyway, it did not end there just because he had lived wrong and he went into heaven. What takes at the ju- place at the judgment seat has enduring consequences. Each of us will be judged. I'm just hitting the yellow ones, <laughs> the yellow spots. I couldn't read it all. But each of us will be judged on the basis of individual opportunities and abilities. Some, of course, will have him more. And that was like the servant that was given the, the ten talents to go out and reinvest, the one with five talents to go out and reinvest, the one with one or two talents to go out and reinvest. Okay? Those who demonstrate in this life an ability and willingness to properly use and invest what God has given to them as abilities or whatever help invest in the future of the kingdom of God for his glory, they will be rewarded. But there will be the, some who will not be rewarded. And the kingdom of God, as he says, will not be the same for all believers. And how many times have I said Jesus Christ at the judgment seat is not some socialist dictator that gives the same size potato for everybody's pot? The kingdom of God, because God expects Christians to be responsible. That's something that has gone and flown out the window when it comes to our Christian culpability or self-responsibility, is that we're all responsible. The kingdom of God will not be the same for all believers. Let me put it another way. Some believers will have rewards for their earthly faithfulness. That's called reigning with Christ and everything else that goes with that. But others will not. Some believers will be entrusted with certain privileges. This is for the millennium, perhaps in eternity. Others will not. Second Timothy 2.12 is very clear about that. We've covered that dozens of times. Some will reign with Christ. Some will not. Some will be rich in the kingdom of God. And some will not. When Jesus said the poor you will have with you always, the context is to the kingdom of God. And I think we think that we're going to get a great reward for a little effort while we're here as Christians. I'm not talking about so much all the duties that we do as Christians, though that's involved, but what we allow God to create in us, i.e., the image of Christ. That's why all this playing that's going on in Christianity is a distraction from being conformed to the image and character of Jesus Christ. Some will be given true riches, others will not. Some will be given heavenly treasures, others will not. Luke 16, 12, Luke 16, 11. Some will rule with Christ, others will not. Revelation 3 and verse 21. This truth may come as a shock to most Christians, Stanley said. Maybe you've always thought that everyone would be equal in the kingdom of God. It's true that there will be equality in terms of our inclusion in the kingdom of God, but not in our rank and privilege. So I think it's a wake-up call. We've been talking about this for a long time, but it's a wake-up call for us that we are not the only ones that see it this way, that I am not a kook because I teach something that people have not heard before. It's because other preachers are kooks because they don't teach the Word of God anymore. So few They get into the programs and the Word of God goes out the window. 
and they use a little verse here and there, and obviously you're going to use individual verses in certain studies, but you get into a study and, and get on with it. Well, that's what we're going to do. Living for the rewards. That's what we're talking about this morning. This is uh, lesson 42 in this study, and we're going to ask you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, please. We continue on here. Verse 54 through 58. That's a passage of scripture that'll snatch you, snatch us, snatch up our attention. <laughs> Says here, uh, verse 54. So when this, in, this corruptible, that is, is that after we've been changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye, corruption will put on incorruption, the mortal, that is, that will die, that, 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 that can die, will put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, he's talking about the body. The soul is already saved when you get saved. But the body is still subject to death, as we know. That's still part of the curse that we carry with us. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, that is when our new body is given to us, we've been changed in a, in a, in a split second, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. You see, if you did not have a visible or a visage or a visible demonstration of your being as an individual, phantoms, ghosts, spirits, would, you would not be able to see yourself or your own image. You would not see what God made when he made you. You would not be able to identify like a dog looking at a, in, into a, uh, and to a, a pitcher, he couldn't pick himself out out of a pitcher. You would not be able to see yourself. You would lose your individuality and your self-awareness. But we have that in heaven. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is in the law. Is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, this is my key verse here. Therefore, my beloved brethren, because of all these things that are going to happen, whether we're living or dead, and when the time comes, for the, when God's going to take us up, wherefore, my beloved brethren, that's for believers, not unbelievers. He's not talking to the unsaved. He's talking to the saved. We are to be steadfast. It does matter if we're sticking to the faith. We are to be unmovable, okay? Always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that because you're going to go be before the Lord, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What we call the kenodoxia Christian, the Christian who is matiotes or empty or vain in their spirit and thought life. And so this is what we'll talk about. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to bless the word and help us to understand uh, all that you have for us. Help us to understand as much as we can. Uh, that honors you and gives you the glory that you so richly deserve. Thank you for this day of grace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ has already secured the cosmic battlefield for us. He has already won the victory over sin, death, and the grave. So they don't hold you. Sin does not hold you or me captive. Death does not hold us hostage and cause us to get fearful. And the grave does not scare us because it will not hold us. Sin, death, and the grave cannot control us anymore. We live for the living, not the dead. With this being clearly stated in the Word of God, then it is perfectly clear that our appointment is not with death but with Jesus Christ. We think about, well, hold on, I've got to go to the hospital. It's not looking good. Well, your appointment, you know, the, it's the end. No, it, you have an appointment with the Lord himself. <laughs> Death will only be the door that leads from the hallways of this life into the parade grounds of heaven. <laughs> Some of us that have been on a parade ground knows the pop, pomp and circumstance behind that. I mean, they had the, 
drum corps that's playing. They have the f- colors that are flying. They have everybody marching in order and up on the parade and up on the bandstand. Well, not they don't call it the bandstand, but where the officials are, it's raised up. And right in the center is the one who has the highest command. And they are seated in a place of prominence. And when you do pass and review, those that are on the front side take a left look, give a salute. The rest of them keep going straight. And then they turn as they pass the review stand. Do order arms most of the time. And that will be Jesus Christ there. And we'll be passing review. And then he'll have his one-on-one with us, according to Romans 14, 12, when that time comes. But when we leave this life, whatever hallway in this world you came out of, a poor hallway, a black hallway, a white hallway, a European hallway, uh, an Indonesian hallway, uh, American uh, North, Amer- North American continent hallway. It doesn't make any difference which one you come out of as a believer in Jesus Christ. If you're saved, you will enter into that parade ground all at the same time. Going all the way back to the beginning of the church age. This is the church age group. This is group company B. We're Bravo company. Jesus is Alpha company. We're Bravo company. And he has taken the fight to the enemy and he's already won the war. Not just the battle, but the war. And not only are his enemies his footstool, or as the Bible says, under his footstool, that is under his authority, so are those enemies under our authority because we are in him. You see, you have authority over Satan through Christ Jesus. But if we are not living in Christ Jesus... Satan is going to try to push his authority or his his false authority over you. Today we are simply basking in the victory that he has secured. As believers, we do not fight to win, but to participate. That's insignificant. We do not fight to win. We do so simply to participate in his victory. The victories are already won. What battles that you and I go through and earn citations and rewards is where we participate in it. It's He allows us to participate in it. And sometimes it can end in death for some. It can end in whatever else for others. But even though this is our legal eternal position in Christ and this is our position of victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil, it seems, though, is that all of us from time to time can forget that we are on the winning team. We forget to look at the scoreboard where the score is always going to be one to nothing. And you're on the one side. You're on the winner's side. You're never going to be on the nothing or the zero side. Everybody that is not in Christ is on the zero side. They were going to lose. And it's of their own choosing. It's not because that God wants them to lose. Second Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And for those who have come to repentance, God is not willing that any works should go up in a bonfire at the beam of seat of Christ. That doesn't honor God. So we stay pretty busy down here on the battlefield of life, and we understand that, but remember the war has already been won. We just get to participate in the skirmishes. Every time we open the Bible, we may see and should see victory. But every time we look at the world, well, we see defeat. Look at the long faces. Look at the horrible things that the world does. Look at all the wickedness that the world does lifts up and promotes. Look how governments promote the wickednesses in the world. And that's because those governments have turned away from God. The people have turned away from God. They have decoupled in their heart, their minds away from God. Psalm 2, 2 through 3. They have decoupled themselves from God. Romans chapter 1. They have said that there is no God. And they have begun to worship beast and four-footed creatures. Their conscience told them that God was real. The heavens proved to them that God was real. And they said, no, I don't believe that anymore. I used to, but I don't believe that anymore. And so they think they're wise. The Bible says they're fools. 
And eventually, because of the hardness of their impenitent, unforgiving heart, um, unrepentant hearts, and their wickedness and the callousness of their hearts, God gives them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are unseemly or unfit. And they don't feel bad about it because their conscience does not ping to their moral awareness any longer. They don't have the ability to know what is morally right from wrong any longer because they have become persistent in their rejection of who Jesus Christ is and who God is. And so God allows them to live in the debauchery of their sins. And the reward is within the debauchery of their sins. But in the outcome, they have this long, sorrowful way of trying to express that they're not living in sin. And it proves to be wrong every time. They see nothing but defeat. That's why they'll go on to the next sin and the next type of sin. There's 24 or 26 sins mentioned in that Romans chapter 1 passage. It's sad. Only Christ can forgive that sin, any sin. Every time I see a person who is saved, give up on Bible doctrine, the Word of God, I see a defeated believer that has forgotten that they are on the winning team, that the score has already been posted, God won, the world, the flesh, and the devil lost. I see too many defeated Christians today, and it's totally unnecessary. You are on the winning team. Write that in large letters and put it on every mirror and door stop of your house. Put it over the lintel. Put it on the mirror in your bathroom. We've already won. Put it next, especially next to the TV set when you look at all these long faces. Oh, what are we going to do? Turn to Jesus Christ. But he's a stone of offense and a rock. He's a rock of offense and a stone of stumbling to me. Well, then just keep on suffering. Shut your mouth. You're getting what you got coming. There will be no rematch. God will not give the devil a second chance when the time is up. There will be no overtime. When the final score is posted, is God won, the world none. There will be no sudden death do-over. There will be no instant replay to see if God got it right. God is the referee. He is the official. He makes the last call. He ends the game. He blows the whistle. It's over. Final. God won. It was not with God. Lost. The way the world looks today, the way America looks today with all of its arrogance toward Christ and its nasty cosmic system with bringing down our freedom, our marriage, our families, and our nation, I cannot see it long before the Lord Jesus introduces all of his saints to the paradise grounds of heaven. Okay. That was the monologue. <laughs> now, Let's get through to 1 Corinthians 15, 58. All right. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain. Okay, therefore, in the Greek, that's a particle, oste, O-S-T-E, which means in the light of. So that in the light of. Therefore, in the light of what has already been secured by Christ, that's our context there in 1 Corinthians 15. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. Present active imperative. You ever hear the word imperative? It means that word is, that verb is written in such a way that it is a command. It's not optional. It's a command. Present tense means continuous action at present time, having present results. And the active voice means God's not going to do it for us. Active voice means the subject of the verb, which is us as a believer. It's responsible for this. Brethren, be steadfast. The word genomai, G-I-N-O-M-A-I, and it means to abide or to exist. To abide. Unmovable. Live every day unmovable. Be steadfast. The word steadfast, idrios, means to be settled, to be firm, to be constant in the word of the Lord, which Paul said in Colossians 1.23 also. Be abounding, 
Be steadfast and and immovable. Colossians 1.23 said, If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature that is under heaven, of which I, Paul, am made a minister. So continue and be faith uh, in the faith and be grounded and settled. First Peter chapter five says, you know, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And then he says in verse nine of first Peter chapter five, whom resists steadfast in the faith. Resist steadfast. Be firm and settled in the faith. When you're tempted to do a sinful thing, remain firm and steadfast in the faith. Don't give in. I want to tell you something about um, uh, leaven. When you put the yeast, I guess that's what that is, into the dough, it spreads quickly, as quickly as it can to get... To get it goes out and reaches. It is never satisfied until it's consumed the whole loaf. You don't have non-yeast. If you have, I guess it's yeast is the leaven. When you put it in, it doesn't stop with a certain area. It doesn't stop until it has consumed the whole thing. The whole loaf rises, right? Never saw a part that looked like a hockey puck. One of those, you, you know what I'm saying. It rises. And that's the way it is sin does in us. When it gets to a part of us, it takes the whole of us. That's why it's so important to keep your sin account short by using 1 John 1, 9 when we sin. Because sin doesn't stop with just a little area of our life. Let's say I have a weakness with, um, uh, I got sticky fingers. I can't stand to see something that's laying loose, not bolted down in my, that's not put in my pocket. Let's say that I, I'm real loose with the truth and I lie. I'm known to be a liar. Well, that doesn't just hold true to being a liar. There's also deceit. There's other things that this person will be a part of as well. Because sin doesn't stop with one. If you give way to one, it will spread to others. That's the way uh, the leaven works. So we have to be steadfast and unmovable. Don't move away from the work of the Lord too. Like believers, we are to come, become more like Christ. And we do so through the inhale, absorption, and exhale of His Word in our life. It protects us and preserves us. And He says, always be abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. Kenos is the word there for empty. There's a purpose for why we come out to church and why we Talk to people about the Lord. There's a purpose for why we say I'm sorry when we've done wrong. It's a purpose why we use 1 John 1, 9. There's a purpose why we're faithful with what He's done for us. Living for the Lord is not, in other words, an empty life. Living without the Lord is the empty life. And I want to tell you that if you're living apart from the plan of God, that something will come in and fill the void of Christ in your heart. Something will come in. A man will come in. A woman will come in. Possessions will come in. Hobbies will come in. All things, legitimate and illegitimate, can come in and supposedly fill that void. But they're never going to fulfill the will of God for our life. And at the beam of seat of Christ, anything that we will have done is just going to go up in a puff of smoke. Like leaven that spreads like sin. Living negative spreads like wildfire at the Bema seat. And as we talked about Wednesday night, what has predominated in our life as Christians? Predominating. And we have to be honest about what not we've just done, but what's in our heart. What's our heart like? Living for the Lord is not an empty life. It's fulfilling. And it has all kinds of rich rewards that the world and the flesh does not have to offer. Only through obedience to the word do we reap a rewarding life. We have eternal life, but we need a rewarding life. And it can also be rewarding in eternity, as Saul and Stanley's book there as well. 
And so I encourage all of us to remain faithful and steadfast to the Lord and to His Word, because that's the only thing that conforms us to His image. That's the only thing that helps us keep tabs. And God wants to keep tabs on us. Uh, we don't really keep tabs on one another. We shouldn't in that sense that we're spying. We care for one another, but we need to know that the Word is caring for us the most. And I encourage you to remain faithful to the work of the Lord. Remain in fellowship with the Lord. I hopefully remain faithful to the teaching ministry of the pastor. And so that as we learn the will of God together, we do the will of God together. I encourage us to be supportive of the needs as we see them that Christ is honored above all. I believe and I feel confident that we are the voice of biblical orthodoxy in an age of apostasy. And not just us only, there's other churches too. Some are notable, most are not notable to the general public. But they are to that, that little pocket of believers over here and over there. Like Elijah thought that he was the last of the prophets and the Lord says, I've got 7,000 more. You're just one of 7,000. There's plenty of other salt pockets here and there and believers who are positive, as it were. If that were not the case, such a judgment like Sodom and Gomorrah would have already crushed America. We would not be existing today because the only reason America existed was for God to get glory through his people through the last 240-some years. And the only reason why America has existed because God is using the believer to exalt the name of Jesus Christ, not only here but around the world. As the name of Jesus Christ gets suppressed more and more outside and inside the church, the more likely judgment is falling on this nation. And I will say that the general public has become so powerful that it is starting to dictate policy for what is taught in the local churches. And that is a shame because weak men are afraid of the general public. They're afraid that they won't keep their congregations up and going and growing. They won't keep that monster of the machine paid off at the bank. They won't be liked. They won't sense that they are worth anything because they evaluate their worth in the eyes of public opinion rather than the Word of God. And they are fools for doing that. Because the world in itself, for the most part, are fools. Jesus says most of the world will go to hell because wide is the path that leads to destruction and narrow is the path that leads to eternal life and there are very few that find it because most won't listen to the gospel. And there are unfortunately a lot of believers who though they will be in heaven because Jesus through their one time of belief in Christ they are in the narrow path. They are also rejecting the narrow point of view. The more doctrine you get from an expository ministry, it will seem like the more narrow your view is. Well, right is right and wrong is wrong. And I don't care how you bake it. It's going to be right when it comes out or it's going to be wrong when it comes out. That's narrow minded. But truth is narrow. Truth is narrow. Truth is always narrow. Truth is not broad. Truth is narrow. Physics proves that. Math proves that. Behavior proves that. Truth is narrow. Don't be afraid to be narrow-minded when it's truth that holds you together. Believers, are not, you're not going to be rewarded based on a lie. You're not going to be rewarded based on a half-truth. Neither am I. You didn't get saved based on a lie. You didn't get saved on a half-truth. It was all true. Believers are preparing, uh, are not preparing for eternity today. That's a big problem. They're preparing to live in this present biological, cosmic, infested world. But that's never going to happen. It's not going to last forever. They're preparing to live in this present age, this carbon-based life form age, forever. That's not going to happen because they're going to die. The divine assets, which the Lord gives to all believers, the indwelling Holy Spirit, a quickened human spirit, positive volition, the Word of God, the local church, gifted pastors to teach the Word of God, those are divine assets which the Lord gives to all believers. 
These divine assets will stand as a testimony to every believer at the Bema Seat of Christ that we all had equal opportunity to reach spiritual maturity and honor the Lord with our lives. Because I can tell you, even when in the most liberal areas of America, there are those pockets of positive believers who are standing true to the Word of God. There might be only 15 in that church, or 10 in that one, or 5 in that one. Or there might be 40 or 50 or whatever in that one. But they're positive. And the Holy Spirit will lead those believers to find out some way that that church exists. That that man of God that loves the Lord more than he fears society exists. They're all over the place. They're in Chicago. They're in New York City. They're all over the place. They are out in the countryside. They're out in California. I know it's hard to believe that, but it's true. I'm sure there's some out there. Because it hadn't fallen off, it lopped off into the ocean yet. <laughs> it's close to, it's close to lopping off into the ocean there. But we will look at those assets and how they affect us at the beam of seat of Christ next time. You might say, well, are we ever going to get to the rewards? Yeah, you're going to get to the rewards, but you've got to learn how you're going to earn them first. And a lot of it is being faithful to the Word. We'll get there. I've already been through them again, looked at them, and reviewed them. Um, but anyway, living for His rewards. That's, that's so important. He's already won the victory. He just lets us participate. And those skirmishes that come along. And we do have our skirmishes, no doubt about it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and for your goodness to us, your kindness. We thank you for the strength that you uh, impart to us in our spirit. And we thank you that it comes forth as living waters and refreshes our, our weary soul and gives us joy and refreshes through that joy a sense of well-being that helps us even in our flesh that we know is eventually one day going to give up and go on to, we're going to go on to be with you and get a new body one of these days. So we're thankful for that victory that's also already been won for us and proven in the resurrection of Christ. Thank you now for this day of grace and for your many blessings to us. Bless us in the next hour as we study the word and fellowship. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.